Father, you sustain us. Lord, you give us the breath that we turn to singing to glorify your name, Father. We, we praise you for that. We ask that you bless this time of the reaction of the book. And he starts it off in kind of an unusual way, unlike the other Gospels, by introducing this one who was the Word, who's been there from the beginning, who was with God, but was also God, and also created all things. And he is light. He is life. And it, the, the build begins to grow until finally there in verse, verse 14, it is the big reveal of who the Word is. And if you're familiar with the book of John, it's hard to revisit a mystery once you know the answer, but that's kind of the way it's been building, all right? So the mystery has been revealed, and there are four basic facts there we looked at last week, covered in verse 14, that number one, Jesus is God. And these facts are really important, because if you deny these facts, you have a false belief in Jesus. You have made up an idol. It is not the real Jesus. But they're covered in verse 14. Quickly, uh, we cover that Jesus is God, that Jesus is human. Jesus did not surrender his deity to put on humanity. And Jesus is indeed God the Son. Jesus is not God the Father. So John the Apostle brings John the Baptist back in also there. If you look back at verse 16, I believe 15. Uh, verse 15, he brings back in John the Baptist. We've covered that in the last couple of weeks. We'll talk about it more in the coming weeks. That it was extremely critical because uh, God had already spoken through Isaiah, through Malachi, through Zechariah about the coming herald that would announce the Messiah. If there was no herald, there was no Messiah. So John lays that out here as well, saying this is him. John the Baptist is the one who is the herald. Uh, but also, uh, there was a huge following to John the Baptist. Lots of people were coming to see him, and, uh, but, but he, he's making this point that Jesus is higher. He's higher in ranking. He's also much, if you, it's hard to say the word older, but because Jesus is actually eternal. So when John introduces Jesus, he says, this is the one who ranks before me positionally, and he's existed for all of eternity, even though John the Baptist was born before Jesus, on earth, and even though John the Baptist's ministry started before Jesus' ministry. Uh, lastly, there in the last verse we covered last week, verse 16, uh, we looked at how this, this grace is grace upon grace that we have received through Jesus Christ, and how beautiful that is. That will tie directly into today's message as well. We are saved by grace alone, and our salvation is preserved by grace alone. So when you are saved, you have received grace. And you will receive grace, upon grace, upon grace, and that's wonderful news, all right? Today we're going to look at verse 17 and 18 of John chapter 1. Look there with me. For the law was given through Moses. Grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. No one has ever seen God, the only God, who is at the Father's side. He has made him known. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, Almighty God, all-knowing God, ever-present God, we worship you today. We praise your holy name. We thank you for who you are, and we acknowledge exactly what John has acknowledged in the opening of this gospel, that you have indeed sent your Son, who is God, who has created all things, to live, to die, to rise from the dead, to conquer death, hell, and the grave, and to give us grace upon grace and assurance of our salvation, that it transcends this life and goes into eternity. And we have that wonderful assurance of our salvation and of the preservation of our salvation for all of eternity. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right, well, if you look back at verse 17, let's begin there. Uh, John says, For the law was given through Moses, grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. Now, there's two things that John seems to accomplish here uh, at the opening of the prologue that we're going to cover. Uh, number one, he's done away with this in the opening verses, is that the Messiah has come, but he has not come just for the Jews, just for the Israelites. In fact, if you look back over there, they are the very ones that rejected him. Now, obviously, some received him. The apostles were Jewish, right, and, uh, and, and a, a couple, several thousand followers there in the book of Acts. 
But the Sanhedrin, the leadership, the Pharisees, the, the, the Sadducees, the scribes, all rejected him, and the vast majority of the Jews rejected him. So John seems to be covering a couple of things here. Number one, in this beginning, he's letting everybody know, and he's already kind of directing this to the Gentiles, to the Greeks, by using the word logos here at the, in the verse 1 of chapter 1. But then he's saying this Messiah is not just the Jewish Messiah, which was a common misbelief that the Jewish Messiah was going to come and free the Jews, kind of like Moses did. So you have a lot of comparison and a lot of contrasting in the book of John with Moses. And you're starting to catch some of this here. So the Messiah has come, the word is put on flesh, dwelt amongst us, but he is not here just for the Israelites, just for the Jewish people. And also, uh, another common misconception would be that the Messiah has come. What does that mean? It means that the Messiah is going to do just like Moses did and put the people back under the law of Moses. So you've got two misconceptions that he's beginning to deal with here in the opening of the book of John. So considering verse 17, look up over there again. What, is the, what was the law given through Moses? And uh, keep that in mind as we proceed through the book of John and even today's sermon. What was the law given through Moses? And a, a good little definition would be something like this. It was an entire system of intertwining rules, regulations, holy days, feasts, priests, sacrifices, and directions on worship that were given by God to Moses for Israel. And this is what we find as we look at the book of Exodus, which we're about to do today. So John is bringing this up, for the law was given through Moses. Grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. We're seeing that something greater has now come than even Moses, the great mediator, the great prophet, the great leader, and even greater than what he was given. So let's look over at uh, Exodus chapter 24 with me. Exodus chapter 24. Again, keep those things in mind. The Messiah has come not just for the Israelites. He's come for everyone. His own people rejected him, John says here in the beginning, but to everyone who received him and believed in him, he gave the right to become children of God. And he has come not to just reiterate the law of Moses. There's a greater purpose. And if we consider Moses, Moses is obviously one of the greatest uh, persons in the Old Testament. You have the Pharisees and Sadducees bringing up Moses quite often and Abraham quite often. They are the, the two primary patriarchs that, that come to mind. And you consider the life of Moses, right? Remember when he was preserved as a baby, when all the children were being murdered. Uh, you consider the burning bush where God speaks through that uh, to Moses and tells Moses that he is going to be the chosen one to tell the Pharaoh to let his people go. We recall the ten plagues that, that God empowered Moses to send upon Egypt and also to pull those plagues away upon him speaking. He could send them or, and rescind them as well. You remember the signs of Moses, right, with the three supernatural signs God gave him to go to the people of Israel, Israel to say, look, God has sent me, and they're going to say, who are you, just a shepherd? Uh, and he says, no, 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 look at this. And there's three supernatural signs that, that God gave to Moses. Anyway, we, we know the Passover happened. Uh, the Israelites were saved. Firstborn of the Egyptians died, the last plague there. The Israelites were set free, and they go on their journey, cross the Red Sea. Red Sea closes back. A lot of you are picturing Charleston Heston right now. I know back in the day, older, older film. But he, they come out. They make their way to the exact place where God said they were to go, to worship him. That was all along the direction given. Come here and you will worship me here. And they arrive. Uh, chapter 24 kind of takes us to the point where God has descended uh, on top of the mountain. The mountain is the entire thing is smoking. It seems to be like on fire. Uh, there's trumpet tears, some kind of angelic trumpet sounding from the top of it. People are scared to death. They won't come near. Also, the threat is if, if they do touch the mountain, they will die. Why is that? Because God's presence is manifested here. They are unholy. He is holy. Uh, God calls up, though, uh, some people to himself. And that's what we're going to look at at Exodus 24. It's kind of uh, this, this giving of the what is now referred to as the Old Covenant. So when John is talking about the law of Moses, he is talking about the Old Covenant. But he's speaking of that here now in the New Covenant era. Jesus has already come. 
But he's going to be comparing and contrasting a lot of this. Moses in the Old Covenant and Jesus in the New Covenant. But first, it's good to understand what this Old Covenant. Now, uh, they, it, and it goes back, if you're in your own reading, like this morning I read chapter 19 forward to catch me up to where we're at today. It just flows really well. You're reading a historical narrative there in the book of Exodus. But just for today, let's look at verse 1. So all these things I've just kind of ran through have already happened. The Israelites were out there. God is this, uh, uh, manifested on the mountain. And then he said to Moses, verse 1, Come up to the Lord, you and Aaron, Nadab, and Abihu, and 70 elders of Israel, and worship from afar. Moses alone shall come near to the Lord, but the others shall not come near, and the people shall not come up with him. Moses came and told the people all the words of the Lord and all the rules. And all the people answered with one voice, all the words that the Lord has spoken, we will do. And Moses wrote down all the words of the Lord. He rose early in the morning and built an altar at the foot of the mountain and 12 pillars according to the 12 tribes of Israel. He sent young men of the people of Israel who offered burnt offerings and sacrificed peace offerings of oxen to the Lord. And Moses took half of the blood and put it into basins and half of it he threw the blood against the altar. Then he took the blood of the book of the covenant and read it in the hearing of the people. And they said, all the Lord has spoken, we will do. And we will be obedient. And Moses took the blood and threw it on the people and said, Behold the blood of the covenant that the Lord has made uh, with you in accordance with all these words. Then Moses and Aaron, Nadab and Abihu, and 70 of the elders of Israel went up and they saw the God of Israel. There was under his feet, as it were, a pavement of sapphire stone, like the very heaven for clearness. And he did not lay his hand on the chief men of the people of Israel. They beheld God and ate and drank. The Lord said to Moses, Come up to me on the mountain and wait there, that I may give you the tablets of stone with the law and the commandment, which I have written for their instruction. So Moses rose with his assistant Joshua, and Moses went up into the mountain of God. And he said to the elders, Wait here for us until we return to you. And behold, Aaron and Hur are with you. Whoever has a dispute, let him go to them. Then Moses went up on the mountain, and the cloud covered the mountain. And the glory of the Lord dwelt on Mount Sinai, and the cloud covered it six days. And on the seventh day he called to Moses out of the midst of the cloud. Now the appearance of the glory of the Lord was like a devouring fire on the mountain, on top of the mountain in the sight of the people of Israel. Moses entered the cloud and went up on the mountain, and Moses was on the mountain 40 days and 40 nights. All right, now that's a lot to read, I know, for a Sunday morning. But I do want you to gather your mind around what's going on. So this is the Old Covenant. The covenant is being made. A covenant basic uh, catechism question, right, is an agreement between two or more persons. You have the agreement here. Biblical covenants are always God downward. God makes the covenants. He makes the covenant here with Moses, with Israel, Moses is the intermediary. He is the middle man. God is speaking to Moses. Moses is delivering this to Israel. Moses delivers the message to Israel. Israel says, all these things we will do. God says, if you're obedient, blessings. If you're disobedient, cursings. Chapter 23 lays out more of those blessings and cursings that are there. So this covenant, God says, obey me. You are my people. You receive the rewards for obedience. Blessings come your way. If you're disobedient, cursings, wrath, and all this big list of things that are going to happen, all right? Now, there's a lot of things interesting here as well that, um, that, that you see the uniqueness of Moses. Out of all the people in Israel, only there, there is this, uh, you have the elders that, are, that come up, and then you have Moses, of course, who is separated with Aaron, then Moses is finally fully separated out to speak with God. And now this old covenant and the new covenant that is made, have lots of similarities. We're going to kind of think back to this Exodus passage I just read over as we continue to look into the New Covenant as well. All right, and here's a couple of things. So how is the forming of the Old Covenant similar to the forming of the New Covenant? Four main points. We're going to kind of look at them. There is a mediator between God and man in both covenants, right? Moses then, but John's point is a greater mediator has now come. The one who is God, the one who is man, he is the perfect mediator between God and man, 
Jesus Christ, the Word becoming flesh. Uh, number two, there is sacrifice. You may not have noticed that in the Old Covenant, but you might have saw that there was blood. Uh, there was an animal. There was sacrifice. There was atonement for sin. There was a blood thrown onto the people also. This symbolized, right, that they did, if they break the covenant, this is what they deserve. They deserve death. Uh, number three, there was eating and drinking, and you might not have caught that. It's really fascinating here. There is eating and drinking with God. Like God is, it calls them up, and they eat and drink as they behold God. Looking back in verse 11 there of that chapter 24. And he, God, did not lay hand his hand on the chief men of the people of Israel. They beheld God and ate and drank. So very fascinating. We're going to get to that here in a moment. Uh, fourthly, uh, blessing and cursing was based upon obedience. Okay, so think, th think of those things and uh, consider those as we move forward. All right, so who is the mediator of the new covenant? Obviously, it's not Moses. And this is one of the main points that John is going to get across. The Messiah has come. He is now the new mediator. His mediation is greater than the mediation that Moses provided back to God. He is the greater mediator. Uh, 1 Timothy 2.5 says this, For there is one God, and there is one mediator between God and man, the man Jesus Christ. If you consider Hebrews, we spent, of course, lots of time over there. Uh, there's lots of comparisons there between the law of Moses and his mediatorial work compared to the mediatorial work of Jesus Christ. I just kind of picked a snippet of it here. Hebrews 8, verses 5 through 6. In that comparison, the author of Hebrews says, They serve a copy and shadow of the heavenly things. For when Moses was about to erect the tent, he was instructed by God, saying, See that you make everything according to the pattern that was shown you on the mountain. But as it is, Christ has obtained a ministry that is as much more excellent than the old as the, as the covenant he mediates is better, since it is enacted on better promises." Now, this is extremely important to the message of the New Testament. A lot of times we refer to the Bible as the Old Testament and the New Testament, right? But more correctly, it really should be considered Old Covenant and New Covenant because that's, that's what this testament is actually meaning. It is, is the New Covenant has come, and we need to emphasize that. John is emphasizing it right at the beginning of his gospel, saying Moses came. Yes, God spoke through Moses, but now one who is even greater has come, and now it's grace upon grace grace and what this means is huge this covenant is so much greater all right so uh, the author of hebrews as we noted is saying hey don't go back to the inferior the superior has come jesus the god man has come this is what john is going to be saying as well don't go back to a lesser covenant go, don't go back to lesser revelation Go back to the word who became flesh. Pursue Christ. Now, uh, as we consider these, these things, the old covenant and new covenant, uh, what is the sacrifice of the new covenant? We looked over there in Exodus 24. We saw where an animal was sacrificed. Blood was put on the altar. Blood was put on the people as well. New covenant. The new covenant is introduced when? The night before Jesus is, is killed, right? Obviously, who is going to be the sacrifice is going to be Jesus Christ himself. And he is the perfect sacrifice that ends all sacrifices. As we noted as we went through the book of Hebrews, if you were just to read the Old Testament without knowing the New Testament, you might very well thought you were supposed to bring a lamb into church today for sacrifice. Uh, but why did you not? Because the mystery has been revealed. The Christ has come. The Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world has been put to death on our behalf. The new covenant sacrifice fully satisfied the wrath, the curse of God, and we are fully saved through that sacrifice. Uh, a couple of passages just to quickly uh, consider. Uh, consider, let's see, look over at, I'm trying to think which one I want to use. There's so many verses that, that point to this, uh, but we want to acknowledge that the ultimate sacrifice has come. Jesus Christ has been put to death, and we have no more sins at all. And so as we think about the new covenant, how wonderful it is, you have grace upon grace. Now, if you're in the old covenant, what happens when you continually sin? You continue to have to bring more sacrifices to the temple. And the temple always had sacrifices going. Why is that? 
because people were continually sinning against God. And there were always sacrifices being brought. There was a Passover feast every single year that they had to have the sacrifices brought. But then we get to the, the great day where Jesus Christ himself is uh, about to be put to death, and you have all these things coming together. You have the sacrifice, you have the new mediator as well, and it's going to be finished. Look over at Hebrews 9. Look this one up with me. Hebrews 9, verses 13 through 15. I know you who sat through the eons that we were in Hebrews are like, we're well, going back on so much today. But there's just, it's just, that's what it, Hebrews is. It's a comparison of the old and the new and the two mediators and saying, don't go back. No, look to Christ. Go forward. Hebrews 9, 13 through 15, just considering this, right? The sacrifice of the old versus the new covenant. Uh, For if the blood of goats and bulls and the sprinkling of defiled persons and the ashes of a heifer sanctify for the purification of the flesh, how much more will the blood of Christ, who through the eternal spirit offered himself without blemish to God, purify our conscience from dead works to serve the living God? Therefore, he is the mediator of a new covenant, so that those who are called may receive the promised eternal inheritance, since a death has occurred that redeems them from the transgressions committed under the first covenant. So here we see the superiority, right? The, the, there are no more sacrifices. There, that, that was a shadow. It was a type. It was prophetic to a degree, looking to the ultimate one who would bring the final sacrifice that would extinguish any need for other sacrifices. The new covenant is better. Also there in verse 14 of Hebrews chapter 9, our consciences are purified from dead works. In other words, we don't rely on our works because deep down inside, we know that our works are insufficient. We can never do enough. You can never obey enough of God's law in and of yourself to say, yes, my conscience is absolutely without blemish. You can't do it. What do we need? We need grace for salvation. What do we need after we're saved? We need grace. What will you need a week after you're saved? Grace. You know what you need is grace upon grace. It's the same thing that we all need. And that's what's so much greater about the new covenant that has come. There in Hebrews 9, verse 15, speaking of Jesus, he is the mediator of a new covenant. And look at this. So that those who are called may receive the promised eternal inheritance. Now, if you look back at Exodus 19, 20, 21, 22, and 23, And forward, you you have the the promise of the land promise that Israel is going to receive. If they are obedient, God is going to drive out the Hittites and the Parasites and the Suffites and every ites you can imagine, all right? He's going to drive them out, and it's going to be supernaturally. He's going to help do this. But if they disobey, that's not going to happen. But their inheritance was based on their obedience. If they get into the promised land, and we, we took note as we went through the book of Hebrews, Uh, Did all the Israelites make it into that land of promise? No, very few, as a matter of fact, right? Only two of the adults, Joshua and Caleb, came back and said, let's go get them, we'll eat them like bread. And all the other spies said no, and all the adult Israelites went with the person who said no, and they didn't believe, they didn't trust God, and they didn't enter in. And here, though, under the new covenant, we who have received and believed in Christ, grace upon grace, and we have received the promised eternal inheritance. This is what we have. This is why we rest assured. We can rest in this grace. All right, so considering these things, who was the sacrifice for each one? Of course, there was the animal sacrifice, but the ultimate sacrifice that I was looking to is Jesus Christ himself. All right, think about this one. Considering those two uh, comparisons, the old covenant and new covenant, who ate and drank with God when the old and new covenants were made? Uh, here, we look back over there, we saw in verse, verse 11 of Exodus 24, it was the, the elders. And now this was, this was something. Uh, it, you have the elders being called up, no one could come to the mountain or they were to be stoned, which is fascinating, right? No one can just come to God, but God says, you, elders, come here. And guess what they did? They went there. <laughs> they went up. And it was not empty-handed. They came under, under another and a blood that had been sacrificed. And you kind of recall even the order that God puts in place and gives to Moses in order for the priest to get into the Holy of Holies once a year for the Day of Atonement. 
They had to go through the curtain, and he had to put blood on the, on the curtain itself. Had to put blood on the Ark of the Covenant, symbolizing this is what I deserve. The, the, another has taken my place so that I can be before you today. That's already going on here. Now the elders are invited to come up to be with God in a very fascinating moment. They eat and drink and they behold God. Now you consider the new covenant. When the new covenant is, is finalized, it is the, the, the day before the crucifixion, the night of Jesus' arrest, and the new covenant is being solidified, verbalized to the disciples. And who is Jesus going to, to eat and drink with during this new covenant? Is it the 70 elders? Because that's what was still going on in Israel. The Sanhedrin, the ones that put him to death, those were the 70 elders of Israel at that time. This, this 70 elder thing continued on all the way into the time of Jesus Christ and afterwards, but they are rejected, or they have rejected Jesus, right? So who is going, he going to eat with? He's going to eat and drink with as the covenant is being made with the disciples. Look over at Matthew 26, verse 26 through 29. It is not the 70 elders that he eats and drinks with and makes this covenant with. They have rejected him. He eats with and drinks with and makes this covenant with, announces it to new leadership, new leaders. They are the ones who have listened to him, received him, believed upon him, and know him. They are his apostles. Uh, Matthew 26, 26 through 29 they're eating the Passover meal, and then, of course, we've noted many times, Jesus changes that traditional Passover meal to show that he is the lamb. Now, as they were eating, Jesus took bread, and after blessing it, broke it, and gave it to the disciples and said, Take, eat, this is my body. And he took a cup, and when he had given thanks, he gave it to them, saying, Drink of it, all of you, for this is my blood of the covenant, which is poured out for many for the forgiveness of sins. I tell you, I will not drink again of this fruit of the vine until the, that day when I drink it new with you in my Father's kingdom. Now, this is huge. This is tremendous. This is what the prophet Jeremiah, this is what the prophet Isaiah, this is what the prophet Ezekiel had pointed forward. The great new covenant that was to come, the great new mediator that was to come is now here. And Jesus, Jesus announces it in very similar form to what happens when Moses gives the old covenant. There is going to be sacrifice, but the ultimate sacrifice is going to finish all sacrifices, Jesus said, is me. It is my blood that will give you permanent forgiveness of sins. That is so permanent that I will eat with you and drink with you again in my Father's kingdom. This is, this is guaranteed. This is salvation. It is security. It is assurance. And also, we note here, he's eating this with, with the disciples, of course, not the Sanhedrin. So, this is similar to what's going on over there when the Old Covenant is made. They're eating, they're drinking. There's not a lot of details given. It's really, it's really perplexing to my mind, and perhaps yours as well, but they, they, that they are called up, they eat and drink, and they beheld God. And we don't know exactly what extent. We know it's not... It's something less than what is about to be revealed over here in verse 18. But in some form or fashion, they beheld God. There is a description of the pavement as blue as the sky. That, 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 that is kind of like when Isaiah in chapter 6 tries to describe what he saw. It's, it's very limited. It's no, there's no great details, right? Isaiah just describes the train of his robe, and that's really it. But in some way, they beheld God, they ate and drank, but over here in the New Covenant, you have God, the Word, who created all things, who is God, was with God, and is the Son of God, who is there sitting with them, serving them. It's, it's beautiful, beautiful moment. All right, now who else takes of the Lord's Supper? Uh, we do, right? Now this is a huge thing. As a reminder, we take of the Lord's Supper. Uh, turn over to 1 Corinthians chapter 11, 23 through 26. Why do we do this? It is to remind us of the great new mediator that has come. It is to remind us that we are now under Christ. The great sacrifice has happened. It guarantees our arrival into heaven as well, that we have been saved. And it reminds us of the very one who has saved us, who has given us forgiveness of sins. It guarantees that we will be with God, that we will behold our God, 
that we will eat and drink with him, and we will behold God in the greatest way possible because we have sins fully removed. We have been remade, and we'll be in his glory. We will be holy. Uh, 1 Corinthians 11, 23 through 26. Paul says, For I received from the Lord what I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus on the night he was betrayed took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way also he took the cup after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant. This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink the cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. So you have this eating and drinking in the old covenant with God. You have the eating and drinking with, with the new covenant with God in the flesh. But also you have this invitation of all the people who believe, who receive in Jesus are guaranteed this as well. It was not just for the apostles, not just for the disciples, right? And you even have uh, fascinating here, even the elders who were coming up before God, they were called upon if there is a dispute between you and someone else, go work that out before you come. Like, that's fascinating. And you go back to, you go over to Corinthians 11, you have some of that same wording there as well. Like, before you're coming into the presence of a holy God, make sure relationships have been made holy, made right as well. It's, it's, it's a beautiful thing. The elders are commanded to do this. Back when that covenant is made, even when we take of the Lord's Supper now, you see something very similar. Um, consider this. What about the blessings and curses for obedience or disobedience in the new covenant? So that was announced, obviously, over there in the old covenant. Uh, you obey, blessings. You disobey, cursings. And this is the good news about the new covenant and why John is making a big deal. Like, don't go back to that. Something greater has come. The very one who created you has actually come. There is a new covenant. Now, don't go back to the law of Moses. Uh, we receive... As believers, the perfectly righteous account of Jesus Christ based upon his obedience. And this is, this is better news than anything you could ever receive. We receive the blessing for his obedience. Uh, was Israel continually obedient to God? Uh, no, just go back and read, right? Go through the book of Judges, and you're just like, oh, man, this is bad. They're continually going off worshiping other gods, continually sinning against God, and, and, and so they continually receive the wrath and curse of God. Then they cry out to God. God gives them mercy. They take advantage of that mercy again and again and again. What do we need? We need a new heart, and that's what's announced in the new covenant. We get a new heart. Now, uh, what happens to the uh, disobedience and the curses that we deserve? Again, you know the story. A lot of this mystery has been removed for us because we've read through the book of John. You've heard the gospel. Uh, but Jesus took the punishment for our disobedience. So here you have the great exchange. In the old covenant, you obey, you get blessings. You disobey, you get cursings. In the new covenant, uh, we receive the ultimate mediation of Jesus Christ between God and man, the ultimate final unblemished sacrifice so that his life, his obedience is the record we get. If you were to die and go to heaven right now, no matter how good you are, you, you could not enter in because you wouldn't be good enough. What you need is to be absolutely perfect. All have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. Every one of us has. So what do we need? We need perfect obedience. Who is the only one that's ever been absolutely perfect and obeyed God in every way where God even announced, this is my son in whom I am well pleased? It's Jesus Christ. So that's, we would have to be, and some people might have said this in tongue-in-cheek before, that you would have to be as perfect as Jesus Christ to get to heaven. That is a true statement, but that is how we get to heaven, is through Jesus Christ. Jesus says, I am the way, the truth, the life. No one gets to heaven except through me. So we get to heaven based on Jesus' righteousness. Where does our unrighteousness go? It goes on Jesus. He takes the curse. He takes the wrath so that we are fully rescued. Many places we could go to look at this. Uh, I'm going to turn to Isaiah 53, if you want to turn there with me. Isaiah 53, the entire chapter is great. We don't have time for the entire chapter, but just going to hit a highlight of verses 10 and 11. It is extremely prophetic of what is going to happen when the Messiah comes and the great sacrifice that he is going to give to right our relationship with God. 
But Isaiah 53, 10 through 11. Speaking about the Messiah who is to come, I'm just going to catch up here in verse 10. Yet it was the will of the Lord to crush him. He has put him to grief. When his soul makes an offering for guilt, he shall see his offspring. He shall prolong his days. The will of the Lord shall prosper in his hand. Out of the anguish of his soul, he shall see and be satisfied. By his knowledge shall the righteous one, my servant, make many to be accounted righteous. That's you, if you have received and believed in Jesus Christ. To make many to be accounted righteous, and he shall bear their iniquities. Iniquities is a word we don't use that often, but it is disobedience. It is sin. It is iniquities, right? Where do our iniquities go? They go back on Jesus Christ. What do we get instead of the wrath and the curse that we deserve? We receive his righteousness. Uh, 2 Corinthians 5.21, I believe I have this one up here for you. It says, For our sake he made him to be sin who knew no sin, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. So this is huge. We have the sacrifice that has come that has ended all sacrifices. It is Jesus Christ himself. We eat and we drink with him to remind us of this great transaction that has happened. Uh, go back to verse 17. Of first of John, sorry, John chapter one. John chapter one. Verse seventeen, he continues on, for the law was given through Moses. Grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. So with this in mind, what does Paul mean by this passage? Is there no grace, is there no truth in the law that was given by Moses? And that's certainly not what is meant here. It's not meaning like they're complete in opposite of each other. But John is introducing the fact that a superior grace and a higher revelation of truth from God has come through Jesus Christ, who is God incarnate. And John will continually write about the superior grace and truth in these coming chapters. Now, how was the new covenant mediator, sacrifice, and leaders received by the Jewish people? It was not, right? They were absolutely uh, rejected all of this. They rejected it all. In fact, as Jesus is being sacrificed on the cross, they still have the beautiful temple in place and sacrifices are still going on. The Passover lambs are being sacrificed over there at the temple Thousands upon thousands of them. There's a big money market there for it as they're exchanging money to, to sell the right lambs. Oh, yours has a blemish. No, you need this one instead. It's a big, big, big scam now. It's going on. The big, beautiful building, that's going on. But where is the real atonement going on? It's on Golgotha. It's Jesus Christ who is being put to death. The, re the leaders rejected him. Jesus, of course, said it is finished. What happens to the curtain in the temple it's torn, not from bottom up, but from top to bottom. What do they do? Apparently, they had some good seamstress. They come in, they sew it back up, and keep on going, right? And for several years to come, of course, they continue this. Now, uh, so at this point, just looking at this, what we've gone over so far, could the Jews, after this point, choose which uh, covenant they wanted, and either one of them work? Uh, can you just say... Uh, I, I like the old better than the new. You know, it's kind of like shoes. You got a new pair of shoes, but the old one feels good. So you're like, you know what? I'm gonna try, I'm just gonna wear the old ones around. Instead, I got this nice new one. Can you just make a choice like that? And the point of all this, and point of John is saying, no, absolutely not. It's like, yes, God spoke through Moses. Yes, God allowed Moses to be a mediator. Yes, the law of Moses did come from God but a greater revelation of God, a greater revelation of truth, a greater expression of grace upon grace has been given through Jesus Christ, so, so don't go back. Uh, the new covenant was the much better replacement of the old covenant. The old covenant, along with the entirety of the law system, was prophetically or typologically pointing to the new covenant. Now listen to this, and we find this in Hebrews as well, but to reject what the old covenant pointed towards was to see the Old Covenant as the ultimate means of grace and to reject God the Son, the full means of God's grace. So it's, you go back, you're rejecting God. You're rejecting His Son. You're rejecting His sacrifice. You're rejecting the New Covenant. 
So it's not either or you get to choose. God ripped the curtain from top to bottom on purpose, not by accident. All right. Uh, God, uh, Jesus Christ, even himself announced the destruction of the temple and it was destroyed and has not been rebuilt. Uh, now there is the new covenant and those who receive and believe in him are God's chosen people. Uh, several passages we could consider. Uh, let's see. Look, just look over at Galatians chapter 3. Galatians chapter 3, verse 19 through 26. Again, it's a little, little lengthy, but uh, it'll be fine. Galatians 3, look at verse 19 through 26. And, and you'll, you'll pick this up a lot as you read God's word. We're, we're seeing it introduced here in John's prologue, but you'll see it throughout. Galatians, of course, you have the, uh, the Judaizers. We've covered them over in, in Colossians as well. Those who are trying to, you have the Old Covenant, you have the New Covenant. You have the Judaizers who are trying to blend them together and saying you've got to do both. You need, you need a foot in each one of these camps. And, and Paul over here in Galatians is saying, no, that's not what God wanted. He's not saying, here's the old, here's the new, put these two wineskins together and something great will come. No, he's saying, you can't do that. They, they will burst. It's not the right, right way to do this. Look over here in Galatians 3, 19. Uh, why then the law, he says? It was added because of transgressions until, now this is an important word. We'll find it several times in this passage. He's talking about the law. He says, it was added because of transgressions until the offspring should come to whom the promise has been made, and it was put in place through angels by an intermediary. Now an intermediary implies more than one, but God is one. All right, focusing on verse 19, he says, the law came until. What does the word until mean? Something greater is happening. It's temporary, right? And that's what we're finding over here in the book of John. Look at verse 21. Is the law then con? to the promises of God? Certainly not. For if a law had been given that could give life, then righteousness would indeed be by the law. But the scripture imprisoned everything under sin so that the promise by faith in Jesus Christ might be given to those who believe. Again, the, something greater has come, not returning back to the law, but re going to Jesus Christ, believing in him. Look at verse 23. Now before faith came, we were held captive under the law, imprisoned, here it is again, until the coming faith would be revealed. So then the law was our guardian until Christ came, in order that we might be justified by faith. But now that faith has come, we are no longer under the guardian. For in Christ Jesus, you are all sons of God through faith. So here you have, again, Paul comparing and contrasting what was given to Moses the, through that mediation and now the mediation that has come through Jesus Christ. The law was there. It was there until, go back to verse 19, the offspring should come to whom the promise had been made. Who is that? That's Jesus Christ. So John is introducing his book over here in the pro prologue. He's saying the Messiah has come, not just for the Israelites, but for everyone who receives and believes him. Uh, the Messiah has come not to just put all you Gentiles underneath the law of Moses. No, there's greater grace, greater truth that's come through Jesus Christ. Uh, turn back a page in Galatians there. Look at uh, chapter 2, verse 15 through 16. Galatians 2, verse 15 through 16. He says, We ourselves are Jews by birth and not Gentile sinners, yet we know that a person is not justified by works of the law, but through faith in Jesus Christ. So we also have believed in Jesus Christ in order to be justified by faith in Christ and not by works of the law. Because by works of the law, no one will be justified. Not one. So this is a key point throughout the New Testament, throughout the explanation of the New Covenant, is not to go back under the laws of Moses and try to do everyone perfectly and justify yourself because no one will be justified. Those who are justified are justified through faith. That's why we say by faith alone, in Christ alone, by grace alone, to God be the glory alone, are we saved. It's by grace alone. So those who believe in Christ. And that's the point of the book of John as well. John, as we've laid out, is laying out clearly what right belief is. This is Jesus the Christ, the Messiah. 
who is fully God, who is fully man, who created all things, who is God the Son. He is the new mediator who is even greater than Moses, who gives greater grace and, and provides even more revelation of truth. The final greatest expression of God's truth is through God himself, God the Son. Now, uh, look at, um, look over, let's go back to uh, John chapter 1, look at verse 18. We'll consider verse 17 done after... 45 minutes there, but, <laughs> but there's, there's a lot there, and it'll be, it'll be brought up multiple times in the book of John as he compares those, the Moses and Christ multiple times. Uh, verse 18 is interesting, and it seems out of place at first. Uh, you're, you're reading along, and you read through verse 17 there, or 16 flows into 17 well. Both are talking about grace, and then you get to 18. And out of nowhere, it seems, John says, no one has ever seen God, the only God, who is at the Father's side. He has made him known. Um, and it's, it's, it's interesting because but I think the flow with these two has to do with Moses. Uh, because you have Moses, he's spoken of there in verse 17. The law was given through Moses. And then in the verse 18, no one has ever seen God, the only God, who is at the Father's side. He has made him known. But if you consider the Old Testament, uh, who had the greatest, most intimate uh, time and presence with God, it would be Moses. And so he's already talking about Moses here. If Moses came, he's given the law, but a greater, greater mediator has come, full of grace, full of truth, full of grace upon grace. And he's also, so I think there's still some comparison going on here. If you consider the book of Moses... I mean, sorry, if you consider the Old Testament, uh, you consider Moses, I mean, his face was changed, right? Because of his immediate presence with God was so, so uh, unlike anyone else. And then uh, Numbers 12, turn over there with me, Numbers 12, look at this. Numbers chapter 12, verse 5 through 9. Uh, there's just no one else like him. He's extremely unique. And he, and he in some manner, got to... I want to use those words carefully, see God, but, but God is spirit, we must worship him in spirit, but there's some way that he was unique in the, his ability and, and call to be with God. Of course, there's no one else's face that turned uh, white where he had to wear a veil over it, right? It was, he was unlike anyone else, uh, only he was called up ultimately and finally to receive these commands of God. Uh, Numbers 12, verse 5 through 9, look what it says. And the Lord came down in a pillar of cloud and stood at the entrance of the tent and called Aaron and Miriam, and they both came forward. And remember at this point, they were saying that uh, they didn't think it was fair that Moses was the leader of the Israelites and they deserved to be the leaders as well. And they tried to put themselves in a position of leadership where all this had been done by God. All right, look at verse 6. And God said, hear my words, if there is a prophet among you, I, the Lord, make myself known to him in a vision. I speak with him in a dream, not so with my servant Moses. He is, a faith, he is faithful in all my house. With him I speak mouth to mouth clearly and not in riddles, and he beholds the form of the Lord. Why then were you not afraid to speak against my servant Moses? And the anger of the Lord was kindled against them, and he departed. And uh, we also acknowledge the curse comes upon Miriam and, and Aaron there. Now, uh, the point of this is, though, we're distinguishing, God has distinguished Moses above anyone and everyone else. Of all the Israelites, God says, uh, the prophets, even, and a prophet is someone who he calls, God calls him, right? You don't make yourself a prophet. But God says, of all the prophets, I speak to them in this way, but to Moses, I speak in extreme clarity to him, unlike everyone else. And so Moses was this one who had this unique, unique relationship with God. Uh, look at Exodus 34. I believe this is on the screen. Verse 29. When Moses came down from Sinai with the two tablets of the testimony in his hand, he came down from the mountain. Moses did not know that the skin of his face shone because he had been talking with God. And there's no one else in the Old Testament that has this happen to them. So there seems to be, my point in uh, John, verses 16, 17, and 18, that there is probably a flow there of talking about the grace, talking about the mediation, talking about 
uh, contrasting the one who is God, who was with God, who is put on flesh, and has revealed God in a way even greater than Moses could because he is God in the flesh. And it, it, according to verse 18, no one has ever seen God, the only God who is at the Father's hand. He has made him known. So the point of this is someone greater has come, someone who has been with God fully, who is God, who is that? That is the word who has put on flesh. His name is Jesus the Christ. So the point of this is, what should we do? Well, knowing that we know the rest of the story, we should thank God that God has sent his son, who is the perfect sacrifice, who is the perfect mediator, who ate and drank with the disciples, who we eat and drink with during the Lord's Supper to remind us that we commune with God. We are in right relationship with him. The sacrifice has happened. The sacrifice took the curse, Jesus Christ. He gives us his righteousness, and by him and him alone are we saved. It is not by our works. It is by grace. It is by faith in Jesus Christ. And we take great rest in that today. And if you're here today or listening and you're relying on anything else that you can do to get you to heaven besides Christ, you're really returning back to this old covenant. Rest in Christ in grace and faith alone in him for your salvation. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the great salvation that has come and help us to see the beauty in it as John is trying to get across in the opening of his gospel. This is good news. Why is this good news? Because our salvation is just, it is, it is so beautiful. It is so wonderful. Uh, the new covenant has come. The new covenant mediator has come. The one who is God. The one who is man. The one who lived absolutely righteous and obeyed perfectly. And we celebrate that. And we acknowledge that today. And what does that mean for us? It means we have forgiveness of sins. That we have assurance of salvation. It means that when we consider the elders uh, eating and drinking and beholding God, that something like that, but even greater, is coming for us that we will be in the new heaven, the new earth, that we will be in heaven. We're guaranteed that because Jesus Christ, the mediator, has removed our sin. We've been given his righteousness, and we will eat, and we will drink, and we will behold our God in a way that right now we cannot fully do. And God, help us to rest in this beautiful grace that has been given through Jesus Christ. Help us to rest in the good.